9, 10 a.m. The Super Station Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Friday. It is Friday, February 5th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Well, it's, look, it's been a busy, busy week. It's been a busy day. I uh, was on Roland Martin Unfiltered today. Uh, we did two hours there on Roland's show. We're going to share an excerpt of uh, that show here. So we have a lot um, of talk dealing with the uh, American Recovery Plan um, pushed by the Biden administration. And we see that there was a uh, meeting that Vice President Kamala Harris had uh, today with African American uh, uh, African American Chamber of Commerce. Okay, she met with African American businesses. Her and uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and they discussed how the American Rescue Plan will help African American owned businesses. All right. Then also, uh, President Joe Biden gave a uh, a, pre a speech today where he outlined his American rescue plan, the, the uh, coronavirus rescue plan and how it would help Americans. Uh, and then there was a, a, a story from uh, the Grio that I saw. We posted about this on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network. Um, this deals with uh, teaching, this deals with uh, an African-American History Month lesson, a Black History Month lesson, gone wrong. An African American History Month lesson, gone wrong. All right. Um, at a school in Wisconsin, some of you may have heard about this. Wisconsin teachers have been put on leave for an assignment asking how to punish slaves. Wisconsin teachers have been put on leave for an assignment asking how to punish slaves. Okay. So we'll deal with uh, those topics uh, today on the African History Network show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts you can, or a woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Uh, sign up for we're going to have to do a, a special segment dealing with love and sex and relationships. We may have to do that offline, but we, we may start on 9 10 a.m superstation and then we're gonna move that over to our social media platforms after midnight <laughs> all right so <laughs> that's enough of that all right cut that out all right so <laughs> sign up for our email newsletter text the word kemet k-e-m-e-t the 22828 the sign up for our email newsletter text the word kemet k-e-m-e-t the 22828 the sign up for our email newsletter also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, the sign up for our email newsletter there as well. Okay, uh, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, then also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. All right, that helps us to... Uh, stay on the air and broadcast six days a week. Keep doing the research, pay some of the bills, et cetera. Uh, also, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, click on the yellow donate button. Okay, uh, let's jump into this uh, first topic here. So um, I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, today, and we talked about Joe Biden's American Rescue Plan. He did a uh, press conference today to discuss that. And then we also talked about the um, the meeting that Vice President Kamala Harris had, the roundtable with um, black businesses. I want to go to this uh, clip number one from uh, uh, 
we'll go to clip number one from MSNBC, uh, Shakita. Uh, Joe Biden outlines his, his $1.9 trillion American rescue plan for economic relief. Let's go to this clip. Take it off of mute. So um, also check out the article from uh, NBC News uh, as well that deals with uh, it, that, that deals with the one point nine trillion dollar plan. Washington moves in unison toward passing sweeping coronavirus relief package. OK, after entertaining uh, working with Republicans, Democrats now appear set on acting to pass a $1.9 trillion proposal. We have the clip queued up. A lot of folks are losing hope. And I believe the American people are looking right now to their government for help, to do our job, to not let them down. So I'm going to act. I'm going to act fast. I'd like to be, uh, I'd like to be doing it with the support of Republicans. I've never been Republicans or some really fine people want to get something done, but they're just not willing to go as far as I think we have to go. I've told both Republicans and Democrats, that's my preference to work together. But if I have to choose between getting help right now to Americans who are hurting so badly and getting dry, bogged down in a lengthy negotiation or compromising on a bill that's, that, that, that's up to the crisis, that's an easy choice. I'm going to help the American people are hurting now. That's why I'm so grateful to the House and the Senate for moving so fast on the American Rescue Plan. Here's what's in that plan. First, it puts $160 billion into our national COVID-19 strategy, which includes more money for manufacturing, distribution, and setting up of vaccine sites Everything is needed to get the vaccines into people's arms. There's simply nothing more important than us getting the resources we need to vaccinate the people in this country as soon, as quickly as possible. So job number one of the American Rescue Plan is vaccines. Vaccines. The second, the American Rescue Plan is going to keep the commitment of $2,000. 600 has already gone out. $1,400 checks to people who need it. This is money directly in people's pockets. They need it. We need to target that money. So folks making $300,000 don't get any windfall. But if you're a, two, if you're a, two, uh, uh, if you're a family that's a two uh, wage earner, each of the parents, one making 30 grand, one making 40 or 50, maybe that's a little more than, well, yeah, they need the money. And they're going to get it. And here's what I won't do. I'm not cutting the size of the checks. They're going to be $1,400, period. That's what the American people were promised. Very quickly, here's the rest of my plan. It has money for food and nutrition so that folks don't go hungry. I think our Republican friends are going to support that. It extends unemployment insurance, which is going to run out on March 13th of this year, to the end of September of this year, because there's still going to be, we're still going to have high unemployment. It helps small businesses, thousands of whom have had to go out of business. It has money to help folks pay their health insurance. It has rental assistance to keep people in their homes rather than being thrown out in the street. It's got money to help us open our schools safely. There's money for childcare, for paid leave. It gets needed resources of state and local governments to prevent layoffs of essential personnel, firefighters, nurses, the folks are school teachers, sanitation workers. It raises the minimum wage. It's big and it's bold, and it's a real answer to the crisis we're in. Well, we were watching the White House right. COVID. All right, pause it right, pause it, pause it right there, uh, Shakita. I know we're coming up on a break. We'll continue this on the other side of the break, and we'll we'll talk about the a round table that uh, Vice President Kamala Harris had with African-American-owned businesses today as well. We talked about that on Roland Martin Unfiltered. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes.
Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at cometicwear.com. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History Mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One on One Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197. 313-645-4197 or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com that's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com you can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com bhistory101 at yahoo.com Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Black Bees products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Friday, February 5th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Call the numbers 313-778-7600, 7600 Here's the call in number if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a a quick question or comment. Right before the break, we were uh, sharing an excerpt of the press conference that um, Joe Biden uh, held today. Actually, his speech, I should say. Uh, I don't think he took questions. Um, And this ties in and this deals with the uh, American Rescue Plan, the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. And uh, this ties into also the meeting that Vice President Kamala Harris had today with African-American businesses uh, to deal with 
how the American Rescue Plan will help African American businesses. And this shows a connection between policies, who's in office, and conditions. Politics is the legal distribution that scarce wealth, power, and resources, the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement, and um, understanding the, the connection between condition, economic conditions, the uh, how, how policies or laws shape the economy, impact the economy, and impact African-American-owned businesses, okay? You got to have somebody in office to protect the economy that African-American-owned biz businesses rely upon to survive. We saw the unemployment numbers, uh, the, what the job creation numbers uh, that came out today. We saw that uh, 49,000 jobs, uh, U.S. economy added just 49,000 jobs in the month of January, all right? And this shows uh, how the recovery is anemic. If we look at um, uh, NBC News. The, we, so, you know, the unemployment numbers, the job with well, the job creation numbers, the job numbers come out the first Friday of each month. The unemployment report comes out uh, the every Thursday about 830 a.m. OK, and that's for the previous week. How many people file for first time unemployment the previous week that comes out every Thursday morning? And the first Friday of each month, the job numbers come out, the job creation numbers. We see the U.S. economy added just 49,000 jobs in January, signaling, signaling ongoing fragility of the labor market. OK, you can read the full labor report at BLS.gov, Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS.gov. We're still in the dark days of the winter with respect to the pandemic and the economy, one economist said. All of this is connected. OK, the economy added a meager forty nine thousand jobs in January and the unemployment rate fell to just six point three percent as the size of the labor force shrank. OK, signaling the ongoing fragility of the recovery. Economists had expected fifty thousand jobs to, to be added and the jobless rate to remain unchanged. January's report, the first monthly release under President Joe Biden, is an improvement from the December twenty from the December twenty twenty uh, report, which saw a reversal of two hundred and twenty seven thousand jobs. I mean, two hundred twenty seven thousand jobs were lost in the um, December twenty twenty report. Um, however, it does not even capture the millions of people economists estimate have dropped out of the labor force. The millions of people economists have, the millions of people economists estimate have dropped out of the labor force and are no longer working, or no, no, no longer looking for work. Okay. They're not even counted in the, that 6.3% unemployment number. That's the U3 number, by the way. Not to make this too complicated, there's six different unemployment numbers. U1, through U3. U3 looks at people who have looked for a job in the past four weeks. That's the U3 number. Okay. If you go to bls.gov and search for how is the unemployment rate calculated, they break this down and they break down U1 through U6. You have to understand what the actual number represents. Okay. All right. And then they break down the unemployment rate through race as well. They break it down by race. So nearly 18 million Americans continue to receive unemployment benefits of some kind. Nearly 18 million Americans continue to receive unemployment benefits of some kind. This is directly tying into directly showing how politics impacts the economy, which then impacts People's businesses, millions of businesses have been closed. 41% of African American owned businesses uh, went, was, uh, went out of business as of April of 2020. Okay. If you look at the article from uh, Forbes.com, I talked about it. You've heard me talk about this before, and we talked about it on, uh, on Rolling Show today. And this is something that I'm pretty familiar with because my degree is in business administration. Okay. So I'm well, this is stuff we study. I'm pretty familiar with this and understanding how politics impacts economics. Read this article from Forbes.com. The COVID-19 crisis has wiped out nearly half 
of black small businesses. Now, this article is from uh, August 10th, 2020, August 10th, 2020. All right. And it talks about how um, nearly half of black small businesses have been wiped out by the end of April 2020 as the pandemic ravaged minority communities disproportionately, according to a report from the New York Federal Reserve. Black owned businesses were more than twice as likely to shutter as their white counterparts, the report found. Nationally, representative, representative data on small businesses indicate that the number of active business owners fell by 22% from February to April 2020, the largest drop on record. Black businesses experienced the most acute or the worst, the biggest decline with a 41% drop. Latino businesses, business owners fell by 32% and Asian business owners dropped by 26%. Okay. Asians were closing up their businesses. So when I hear people say, we're not going to vote, we're just going to do economic empowerment, do like the Asians. You mean you're going to close your business down? Because that's what many Asian businesses were doing, shutting down. It was 41% in April, 2020. It's at least 50% by now of black owned businesses that have gone out of business. So read this full article here from Forbes.com. This is showing you how politics, laws, and policies impact the economy, which then impacts African-American-owned businesses and economics at the main street level, the individual level. All right. Now, this is something that Vice President Kamala Harris talked about when she spoke to Black-owned businesses today. Okay. So, um, let's go to clip two. This is from uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, today. I was a panelist. I'm a panelist usually every Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. The past couple of Fridays, they had to change the, um, they didn't have any panelists because you had um, Hank Aaron who passed away. Uh, and then you had Cicely Tyson who passed away. So they had special shows. Um, first, we talk about uh, Joe Biden's, uh, speech, and then we talk about uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Let's go to this clip, Shakita. The, the thing here, Michael, is the Republican governor of West Virginia was begging for the money. Well, he used to be a Democrat, then he flipped the Republican when Trump was there. Don't be shocked if he mm -hmm. flips back to Democrat while Biden is there. Uh, and so he made the point they need the money. Because Republicans right. did not like this particular bill because they felt that it was too much money for uh, uh, local and state governments, for them bailing them out. Uh, when they really only want to target those blue cities, those blue states. Uh, uh, again, if Democrats are smart, every move you make is all about how you are helping those who make less than two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. Any, if you are a family out there and you're making 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 grand, trust me, you don't give a damn about somebody making five, five times as much money as you, uh, who all of a sudden, uh, it says, well, what about us? Um, trust me, if you're making combined 300 grand a year, you're doing fine compared to most Americans. Yeah, for the most part, that's true, Roland. And it's it, interesting you mentioned um, some of the governors because you, you're going to have a lot, I, I think you're going to have a lot of Republican governors. They have a lot of poor white people in their, in, in, in their states who need this money. And the other thing is, Blue-leaning states or Democratic states contribute more each year to the federal taxpayer pot than red states, than Republican states. And this is something that Governor Cuomo of New York pointed out a few months ago uh, to uh, Moscow Mitch McConnell, who's in a very poor state, Kentucky, Mitch McConnell. Uh, so I, I think what they're doing is a really good strategy to, put, to push this. I think you may have, like in the House, you may have a handful, maybe some of those 11 Republicans that voted to uh, uh, strip Marjorie Taylor Greene of her uh, committee assignments. You may have a handful of that, but, but we can't wait. And it's extremely important for them to connect these policies to the economy and to the economic conditions of individuals. The reason why is because 2022 midterm elections are right around the corner. And as the Guardian.com pointed out, and I've dealt with on my show and you've dealt with on your show, 
Republicans and state legislatures across the country have introduced 106 bills to make it harder to vote, especially for African Americans and Latinos, et cetera. So we have to make a clear connection between these policies in Washington, D.C., and the economic conditions down on Main Street. Uh, and again, hopefully uh, you will have an administration that actually says, let's put the money where there is most in need. Uh, yes. Today, Vice President Harris, as well as uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, sat down with black business leaders to talk about this very issue. Here's some of that one-hour discussion. February, it is Black History Month, but I think as we all are concerned, Black History Month is every month. And um, so this conversation is not only for today, it is part of an ongoing conversation we intend to have um, with you as the leaders that you are. And when we look at our, our black businesses in our country, they range. We are talking about software companies. We're talking about healthcare companies. Um, yes, we're also talking about the beauty shop, the barber shop, um, but we are also talking about health care. We are also talking about child care. We're also talking about manufacturing. Um, because black businesses, of course, are engaged in the business of keeping America running. And so in every sector, these businesses are present. And that is how we think of then the role that you play, but also our responsibility to support you in all of those sectors. Um, and during this pandemic, as the Secretary has said, it, this has been rough. Um, we have all seen estimates that as many as 40 to 50 percent of black businesses have been sold. we know small businesses, of which the majority of black businesses are, um, employ 50% of America's workforce, either because that, that worker is a small business owner or works for a small business. So when we're talking about the impact on the overall economy and, and, and country, it's profound. And, um, and our research also has shown that in the pandemic, um, and this is something that is a lived experience for many of you and your members, the PPP program, um, was not accessible to so many of our black-owned businesses. And it had to do with a multitude of issues, which included that those businesses were not necessarily engaged with um, the big banks, didn't necessarily have the familiar or the consistent uh, relationship, if not any relationship, with a banker who could then call somebody up and say, Miss Smith, this thing is coming down and this is how you apply for it. Um, but what we know is those relationships do exist. And so for whom those relationships are, are, are intact, they got the benefit. And for whom those relationships are not intact, they did not get the benefit of the PPP. So the president and I, together with the secretary, have been looking at how we can do better, knowing the mistakes that were made, and improve on what we need to do to bring relief to the businesses of our country to help our economy grow. So we are thinking of it in two ways as a general matter. There is the piece of it that is about what we need to do to get control of the public health component crisis of the pandemic. And so I'm going to talk for a minute about vaccines. And it is about getting our business back up and running, understanding those two points are inextricably linked. That the reason, one of the reasons we got into the catastrophe, the most recent catastrophe, I'm going to put aside pre-existing issues, um, but the most recent catastrophe around our, our black businesses is because also we need to get control of the pandemic. So on the subject of the, of the pandemic, we uh, have crafted and the president has, has, um, has proposed the American Rescue Plan. And a large part of that plan is focused on vaccination. And so, for example, we are putting in um, $400 billion dollars to um, have a vaccine distribution plan. And this is the first time that the federal government has come in, sadly, since the pandemic started, to support states to do the vaccine distribution piece. But that's gonna be up and running. So part of what we're gonna ask is for your assistance and support for that component, not only of the American Rescue Plan, but what we need to do to actually make it work, meaning getting folks to go and get vaccinated. Because it's good to have a vaccine, but if folks don't get vaccinated, it won't save the lives we intend to save. Um, we also have a part that is basically about bringing the economy back to full employment and, um, and doing that in a way that we understand that black workers see the biggest wage gains 
when the economy is at full employment. So the way we're going to do that is, yes, by the vaccinations, but also we need to reopen schools and reopen them safely. Um, so that is part of our American Rescue Plan. Also, we made a commitment for $2,000 of relief to families. There was a down payment on that in the previous bill of $600, and we intend with this next bill, the American Rescue Plan, to have $1,400 checks going out to those folks who are most in need by way of relief to help them get through this moment of crisis so that at the end of it, they can get back up um, and, and, and recover in the way that we intend. And also, more specifically, for our businesses, we are also creating a specific package of, of relief that is about $15 billion. This did not exist in previous bills, in the relief bill. $15 billion going to grant programs, not loans, grants, targeted at our smallest businesses, of which the majority of black businesses are, and targeted at our black and brown and minority-owned businesses. So this is some of the work we are doing in addition to, as the Secretary said, what we are doing around um, the CDFIs, the Community Development Financial Institutions. And as a point of personal pride, that was one of the last things I worked on when I was in the Senate, together with Senator Cory Booker, Senator Mark Warner, and others. And the idea is, is basically to put more capital, to infuse more resources into our community bank, knowing that those are the ones that have the relationship with our businesses and are best equipped to support them, not only by way of grants and loans, but also by way of helping them grow their businesses, helping and surrounding them with the infrastructure of skills and resources they need to sustain a business. So these are some of the areas of focus. This right here, uh, Michael, is where, again, targeted efforts need to be made unlike where you had the Trump folks who it was all about big business and helping those who already got money. Well, not only was it all about big business and helping those who already had money, it was also removing the uh, inspector general who watched over how the money was distributed, okay? And so, so, and then we found out that uh, you had like some Trump-related uh, uh, businesses or something like that that got uh, 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 money as well from uh, the first round of the, uh, I think it was the first round of the uh, stimulus bill. So this is extremely good. I, I, I'm glad uh, uh, Madam Vice President Kamala Harris uh, had this meeting along with Janet Yellen. And, I, and again, this is an example of how um, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. It's important for us to go back and look at the article for Forbes.com from uh, April of 2020. 41% of black-owned businesses had gone out of business because of the COVID economy as of April 2020. Now, it's probably at least 50%. So what we just saw is the example, is an example of how elections have consequences and African-Americans voting their interests. So we have to follow through on this. But what I just saw, you know, that's, that's a start. I keep saying, I mean, you should follow the money, follow the money. Hey, follow okay, the pause, money. pause it right there. At the uh, end Shakita, of the day. Pause it right there. Okay, so all this is connected. All this is connected, okay? Uh, now, you have some people. Um, let me see. Let me go with this. I just say 1,400. It's 600 plus 1,400, which is 2,000. But it's a $1.9 trillion bill. Look at what's in the bill. See, this reminds me of um, when you had the $2.2 trillion stimulus bill, the coronavirus bill, and there was a $1,200 stimulus check, and fathers who were behind on child support, they would keep either a portion or all of the check. Uh, it, well, I'm sorry, they wouldn't keep it. It would go to the child. It would go to the custodial parent. It would go to the mother to go to the child. And you have people putting out videos and things like this about this. Now, now that was based upon 1996 tax law. That wasn't something they created for that bill. That was based upon existing tax law that's been in effect since 1996. One. Two, the bill was a $2.2 trillion bill. 
there was a whole lot in that bill that could help African-American communities, et cetera. And instead of us now, you, now some African-American businesses did get uh, small business money, the, the, the paycheck protection money. A lot of them were locked out for various reasons. Some of them did. Some of them did get the money who had banking relationships, who were more established, et cetera, and whose paperwork was in the way. The question I kept asking, and if you saw my broadcast back then, we broke down what was in that two point two trillion dollar bill. There was like two trillion dollars worth of opportunities. The twelve hundred dollar stimulus checks that was only I think if I remember that made up only about. Two hundred billion dollars of the two point two trillion dollar bill. You got two trillion dollars worth of opportunities. There was opportunities for contracting for businesses. Why were we focused on the two trillion? Because other people were. Why are we focused on the two hundred billion over here that people putting out videos about? Baby daddies don't get a twelve hundred dollar check, as opposed to focusing on the two trillion over here. Because you had other people talking about the two trillion dollars. How you doing, TC Cook? You had other people talking about the two trillion, focusing on that. We're focusing on the little money over here. So we have to change our perspective as well. Now, the other thing about the the, the money, and, and go watch the go read the article from um it was originally from the griot.com, picked up by Yahoo News, written by April Ryan for the griot. Okay. And um, we'll pull it. You know, we talked about Byron Allen yesterday on the show. Uh, so we'll pull this up from the griot. Because, um, you know, April Ryan is doing a great job over at the griot. So let's go back. Uh, let's pull this article up here. And they break down what's in this bill. When you talk about fifteen billion dollars for this is going to the smallest of small businesses, which helps African American owned businesses. Okay. But you have to apply for the money. All right. If you just sit back and just talk about we don't have this, we don't have that, and you don't apply for the money, guess what? You're not gonna get it. Your your paperwork has to be in order to get the money. I used to teach entrepreneurship. I taught entrepreneurship for seven years. I taught in, in um, I taught entrepreneurship. There was a government program that we helped uh, that, that was um, where the participants in the program got grants. The small businesses got grants, but they had to uh, they got grants for their small business. And I, I was one of the instructors for the class. But their paperwork had to be in order. Tax returns, LLCs. Uh, paperwork, uh, 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 articles of organization, things like this. They, they, their, their paperwork had to be in order to be able to get the money. And it was free money. It's a grant. You don't have to pay that back. So you're going to have a lot of people complaining. Okay. And you're going to have some people say, well, you know, minorities can apply for this money. So my response to them is somebody who's actually managed African-American-owned companies that have had government contracts with the city of Detroit, County of Wayne, and state of Michigan. And we were employed, we, we had African-American employees who were taking care of their families as somebody who's actually put in bids in one government contract. The question I would ask those people who probably never done any of that, the question I would ask them is why wouldn't we focus, why wouldn't we focus on being the majority other minorities get the money and apply for the money. If the money's there, fifteen billion dollars in grants to the to the hardest hit small businesses. If the money's there, why would we sit up on social media complaining, as opposed to focusing on being the majority of the quote unquote minorities applying and getting the money? Because many people's minds are wired to complain and, and, and not wired to conquer, not wire, wired to accomplish. OK, this is why you have to be careful of who you spend your time with. If you hang around four broke people, you're going to be number five. 
you have to be careful of the company that you keep. You have to be careful of the information that you read. Your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. When you study, when you study gurus of sales like Zig Ziglar, Tom Hopkins, when you study people like uh, Les Brown, but even more so like Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, this is the type of information that you're going to get. I've read, I've read all of them. I have tons of books dealing with sales because I was in sales for over 20 years. I have tons of books dealing with business and sales. I don't just study history. My degree is in business administration. I'm, I'm a historian, but I got I have a varied background. This is extremely important right here. This ties into policies. Okay. But all this right here, this bill, this is the result of African Americans voting their interests and voting Trump out of office and voting in. Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. This is the result of organizing. This is the result of African Americans voting our interests and realizing that Trump was deaf and he's got to go. And other people agree with us and realized it also. So read this auto article here written by our sister April Ryan for the griot.com. Vice President Harris holds roundtable with Black Chamber of Commerce. This is from February. Uh, this was uh uh, February 5th, 2021. Okay. All right. We'll post the link here to this article. Cause I, you know, I oftentimes hear a lot of people say all this, you know, all these, um, uh, people popping off at the mouth on social media. I call them mouth poppers. And then you ask them, well, what have you done? What have you accomplished? You ever had government contract? You ever done this? You ever done that? They ain't done none of that stuff. They just running their mouth. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> that's why I don't spend a whole lot of time around them. All right. Uh, next, let's, let's go to this. I want to go to this next story here. This is um, dealing with Wisconsin. All right. And Wisconsin teachers put on leave for an assignment asking how to punish slaves. All right. Now, you know, as we're talking about my online course that's starting up Tuesday, um, February 9th. 2021, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And one of the things we deal with in the online course is an eight-week online course that meets Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Uh, to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I mean, I, gotta, I have to come and be here on Tuesdays. Um, we deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, Okay. And we deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we deal with ancient Ken Kemet, ancient Egypt, et cetera. Uh, so we just posted the link here. As soon as you register, you can start watching uh, the, the class that I did in 2019 because it's archived there. So we do the class live. All the sessions are archived. You can go back and watch it over and over again. All right. Um, and it's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the homepage. So this is right in time for African American History Month. You can watch from around the world. Uh, it's regularly one hundred thirty dollars. It's on sale eighty dollars. But one of the things I deal with in the, in, the, in the class, and I also talk about this study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, teaching hard history of American slavery, teaching hard history of American slavery, that came out February of uh, it was like it was um, right about February twenty eighteen, right around February first, twenty eighteen. This study, and you can download this, uh, it's free. You can download this. Go to splcenter.org, splcenter.org. You can download this study. It's a 52-page study, and it deals with how the history of slavery is incorrectly taught in schools all across the country, incorrectly taught to African-American students, incorrectly taught to white students. This story out of Wisconsin is an example of that. And they did a survey of um, 1,000 high school seniors, but also a survey of about 1,700 uh, social studies teachers, okay? And they found how little the, the students knew about slavery. Only 8% of high school seniors surveyed could identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War, and 68% uh, did not know that it took a constitutional amendment to formally end slavery, the 13th Amendment. The, the advisory commission, uh, that the advisory panel that put this together, 
is chaired by uh, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who I've interviewed before. Uh, we were talking about John Lewis and the civil rights movement. Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who's a nephew to one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. So if you look at um, uh, if you look at this one here, this article here, this deals with Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin teachers put on leave for an assignment asking how to punish uh, slaves. So Madison, Wisconsin teachers on, are on leave after creating an assignment asking students how to punish slaves appropriately. Uh, sixth, grade student, sixth grade students at Patrick Marsh Middle School were studying the laws of the King of Hammurabi in ancient Mesopotamia when they were asked how they would, quote unquote, punish a slave as an assignment. Now, Desaria Irvins, was, uh, whose son attends the school, said what made the assignment even more piercing is the fact it happened on the first day of Black History Month, African American History Month. And probably on our, our show Sunday night, we'll deal with the history of African American History Month and the we'll deal with the... Uh, uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, an association for the study of Negro life and history, and he co-founding the association September 9th, 1915. And 1915 was the 50th anniversary of the end of the Civil War and the 13th Amendment of all that. We'll probably deal with that on Sunday show. All right. Um, so the uh, Zaria Urbans said, quote, I can see how they're learning about this era, but the word of, of the question and the statement, it was just wrong, okay? But, but the wording of the question and the statement was just wrong. She said this to uh, NBC affiliate Channel 15. She went on to say, I was just shocked. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I was just shocked. I couldn't believe what I was uh, reading, okay? Uh, we're going to those watching on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Keep watching. We're going to keep uh, broadcasting. We'll finish up this story. We're out, we're out, we're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. on the Superstation WFDF. Uh, also, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. And through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. If it comes up with the AfricanHistoryNetwork.net, I own that also. It's just AfricanHistoryNetwork.com redirects to the AfricanHistoryNetwork.net. I own both domains, okay? All right. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you uh, tomorrow night. We'll talk to you Sunday night. Peace. All right. Stand by, everybody. Okay, how's everybody doing? All right, so we're here Monday through Friday, uh, 6 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, okay? And uh, Monday, Monday through Friday, 11, sorry, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. I was thinking of six, six days a week. Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. And uh, uh, Sundays, um, we're still here Sundays, uh, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time also, okay? All right, so let's continue with this story here. Um, I'm going to pull up this article. This is from the Grio. Um, and I saw a couple other outlets uh, had this story as well. Okay, how's everybody doing? So this is from, uh, this story is from February uh, 4th, 2021. Okay, uh, from the Griot.com. Let's go to this story here. Then African-American business owners post name your business here on the thread of the broadcast and uh, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. OK, so Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin teachers put on leave for an assignment asking how to punish slaves. OK, the Zaria Urbans, um, whose son attends the school, said. What made the assignment even more piercing is the fact that it happened on the first day of um, that it happened on the first day of Black History Month. All right. So if we uh, look at the story here, 
And th- once again, this is an example. I- I've covered a number of different stories of um, slave sto- um, history assignments or assignments dealing with slavery gone wrong, reenactments of slave auctions, all different types of things like that. And one of the things, one of the things that's really good about the uh, study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, teaching hard history of American slavery is that it gives recommendations of what not to do, how not to teach history, okay? And one of the things that it says don't do is don't do slave reenactments, okay? Don't do slave reenactments, all right? Um, That's one of the things that it says don't do. And it gives a whole list of recommendations of how to more correctly teach the history of slavery. OK. All right. Don't pay attention to the dumbass trolls. I'll just block them. Don't we don't have time to deal with that. They have they don't have a life, nothing better to do. OK, so. Um, don't even worry about that. All right, let's continue here. So I want to try to pull this up here. NBC Channel five in. um NBC Channel 5. Let's uh, see if we can pull up this clip here. Uh, Okay. Okay, we got to pull that up. Just stand by. Tonight, classroom controversy. The principal of Patrick Marsh Middle School in Sun Prairie is apologizing after this assignment asked sixth graders a hypothetical question about slavery. NBC 50's Michelle Beck spoke with one mother who brought her concerns to administrators. And Michelle, there's an internal investigation underway. 12-year-old Xavion Hopkins took the assignment to his mom, not telling her what exactly it was. But by the look on his face, his mom says she knew something was wrong. I just grabbed the laptop and I looked at it and I was just like, what? You know, and just shocked um, that I couldn't believe what I was reading. During social studies class Monday, Desaria Irvin's sixth grade son, Xavion, learned about ancient Mesopotamian law, Hammurabi's code. I can see how they're learning about, about this era. But the wording of the question and the statement, it was just wrong. The activity presented different scenarios, but the one that drew controversy at Patrick Marsh Middle School asked this. A slave has disrespected his master by telling him, you are not my master. How will you punish this slave? It made me think of how they would treat me if I, if I was in person in class. What would they think of me? And like I was like, and would they treat me like I was an outsider and it made me feel scared and unsafe. Irvin says she took her frustration to the teacher and the principal. Later that day, Principal Rebecca Zahn explained in an email to all families, the purpose of the activity was to help students understand how order was kept in the early civilization, how the laws were developed and how unjust they were. She continued, we know that it caused harm to our students and their families. Our intent missed the mark, and for that, we are deeply sorry. To really give this a name, is this an act of racism? The family also connected with Michael Johnson, the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Dane County. He says he took the issue to the superintendent. It's a lack of cultural competency. It's a lack of training. And there might be some underlying issues that we don't know about. Superintendent Brad Saren also wrote to families this afternoon apologizing for a, quote, grave error in judgment. He explained the activity was not part of a district curriculum and that teachers involved have been placed on administrative leave. Live in the newsroom, Michelle Beck, NBC 15 News. Okay, so that is uh, from NBC uh, Channel 15 News. Um, If we go back, if we go back to the article here, from the Grio, uh, it says Principal Rebecca Zahn and Associate Principal Amy Scherniker said, quote, we regret that this assignment was not racially conscious and did not align to our district's mission and vision of equity. OK, uh, we know that it caused harm to our students and their families. 
our intent missed the mark. And for that, we are deeply sorry. Going forward, we will be sure to think critically about whether our intent matches our impact. Okay, so, uh, and you heard Irvin's, uh, um, Desario Irvin's son, uh, Zavion, said the assignment deeply troubled him. And one of the things, when you read the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, one of the things they talk about is how the slave reenactments in some of these uh, history lessons dealing with slavery can be traumatic for students, make them feel inferior, uh, can cause problems when they're, when they're not done correctly. OK, this sounded like one of those um, lessons gone bad, slavery lessons gone bad. Now, the Sun Prairie Area School District placed the teachers on administrative leave pending an investigation. Uh, they did issue an apology. Okay, so you heard Michael Johnson, who called the assignment a lack of cultural competency. Um, Desario Irvin, Irvin's also reached out to the CEO of the Boys and Gr Girls Club of Dane County, uh, Michael Johnson. Now, this story comes on the heels of a Michigan teacher. And you, you, you'll see these stories periodically. This, this story comes on the heels of a Michigan teacher issuing a similar assignment back in December 2020, as previously reported by the GRIO. A Detroit mother is concerned and upset after her daughter's seventh grade teacher thought it was appropriate to ask students uh, the best way to discipline slaves. This was reported by WXYZ Channel 7 here in Detroit. Quote, I never want my daughter to feel that way again. The way she felt this morning, said uh, Jala Holt, the girl's mother. Uh, it, this was at Frost Middle School. Um, Jade uh, is a seventh grader at Frost Middle School. She said it was weird. It was weird and uncomfortable. This is in uh, Livonia, which is a white suburb of Detroit. And she said this in regards to how she felt about her coursework. Uh, to uh, WXYZ Channel 7. She said, I read the question and typed my answer. Uh, it was there. Uh, it was there will be no punishment because I do not believe in slavery. Okay, that was her answer. There will be no punishment because I do not believe in slavery. Now, the question asked, the, the question read, a slave stands before you this slave has disrespected his master by telling him, you are not my master. How will you punish this slave? OK, these are this. That's not the way you don't want to teach slavery like that. History, nah, that's not too good. All right. Now, concerns the school issued a statement contained by uh, obtained by Channel 7 News. Concerns from a parent were brought to our attention this morning, and we have reviewed a social studies assignment uh, given to three classes of our seventh grade students. Uh, we apologize. We recognize. We recognize the assignment in question was not constructed appropriately, as we believe in the importance of approaching topics of slavery in any era of world history with the utmost care and consideration. All right. So check out uh, this article here from uh, the griot.com. This deals with another uh, history lesson gone wrong, gone awry. Wisconsin teachers put on leave for an assignment asking how to punish slaves. It sounds like the teachers were not African-American. Um, it sounds that it doesn't sound like it sounds like the principal and the assistant principal sounds like they were not African-American either. OK. All right. How's everybody doing? We have uh, Michelle, uh, Donna, Nicole, a few of the people watching. Greg, Rhonda, all right. Um, you heard me talk about the uh, bundle pack we have at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, all the substance. Keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. So 
for African American History Month, we have a 15 uh, DVD bundle pack that includes 15 of my uh, lectures, uh, DVD lectures that I've done. It's also in digital download format. Uh, the Michael M. Hotep uh, 15 DVD bundle pack. Okay, this is at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, and I'm going to pull this up here. It's right on the homepage of our website. It's on sale, $100. It's a uh, 15, uh, 15 DVD bundle. And let's see here. I think we uh, still have it up. Yeah, we still have this up here. Let me uh, show you this quickly. Also on the homepage of our website, we have the uh, where you can register for our, uh, our online course. The online course I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And that's going to be eight consecutive Tuesdays, starting Tuesday, February 9th, uh, 2021, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But uh, very quickly here, so we're shipping uh, these out daily. This is a 15 DVD bundle pack. Includes uh, all the lectures are done uh, by me, and you get lectures dealing with the film Black Panther that I've done. That shows how the film Black Panther relates to African history and culture and language, things like that. Uh, you get uh, this one here dealing with the history of African American History Month. Many people don't know the history. I do lectures across the country. Many people don't know the history of Black History Month and Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which is now called the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And a lot of people don't know the annual theme. Uh, there's an annual theme for African American History Month. This year's theme is the Black Family uh, uh, Identity Representation and, um, uh, let me see, Identity Representation and uh, Diversity. The Black Family Representation, Identity and Diversity. That's the annual theme for African-American History Month 2021 from Masala Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. There's been an annual theme going back to 1928. I've looked at the annual themes uh, going all the way back to 1928. OK, and the annual theme helps to give purpose and direction to the celebration each year. As opposed to just recycling the same 15 to 20 sanitized Negroes every year and people getting tired of that, not want to go to African-American History Month celebrations. OK, uh, because that happens also. All right. So you, you get uh, my presentation dealing with uh, breaking the chains while we celebrate African-American History Month, exposing the myths. Uh, you get that one. That's about a three hour presentation. And then uh, also Malcolm X, 50 years later, why is he still relevant? Uh, this one here dealing with the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the revolutionary, will not be televised on the television, uh, on the television. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. I deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. And um, the, the, this is the Dr. King they don't show you every Dr. King day. All right. They don't deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. They don't deal with the Dr. King that tried to get a uh, concealed, concealed pistol license. Um, in 1956 during the Montgomery bus boycott because he was getting death threats and he, his, his house was firebombed twice in 1956 because of the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, so th they don't deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. All right. So you get that one. Uh, also, uh, the second one here dealing with the film Black Panther, lessons from the film Black Panther, economic guerrilla warfare, political self-defense, and how to Wakanda the vote. This deals with uh, this presentation deals with how do we take the enthusiasm from the film Black Panther and actually use it for political empowerment and um, economic empowerment. OK, um, so. So we have that. We have that one as well. Uh, then we have. Let's look at this here. So we have that one. Then we have this one here, the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, uh, and also deal with the Electoral College, the origins of the Electoral College, 
how it actually works. In the three-fifths compromise, uh, we deal with the Philadelphia Convention in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution, that people mistakenly think, said we were three-fifths of a human being. Uh, that's not, uh, that's not, um, that's not what it, that's not what it said. Okay. It's dealing with representation. How do you, how do you determine how many seats in the house of representatives slave holding states will have? Okay. That's what that's dealing with. How do you determine how many seats in the house of representatives, uh, slave holding states will have? Okay. That's what that's dealing with. Okay. All right. So we we'll deal with that also. And uh, because that's oftentimes misunderstood. A lot of people think it was saying we were three fifths of a human being. No, it's counting three fifths of the population of the slave holding states. OK, so if uh, Virginia, hypothetically, if Virginia had. A hundred thousand slaves then you would count 600,000 of those slaves to determine how many seats in the House of Representatives uh, Virginia would have. That's what it was dealing with. It wasn't saying it was three-fifths of a human being because some, because a lot of the Southern states didn't recognize their humanity at all, okay? It recognized them as being human at all. And then at the same time, the free population, um, the full population of free African-Americans was counted as well, even though it was a small population, depending upon classification, et cetera. But the full population of free African-Americans at the, at the, at the time was uh, counted. So we have that presentation. Then we have uh, this one here, dealing with entrepreneurship and economic empowerment, 13 forms of wealth and redistributing the pain keys to economic empowerment and entrepreneurship for African-Americans. And I tie that into historical African-American figures as well. Uh, you get this one here, the uh, racist history of the white national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. We deal with the history of the Pledge of Allegiance and Francis Scott Key, who wrote it uh, during the War of 1812. It was in uh, 1814. Uh, he wrote that. Uh, and then the, the we deal with the Pledge of Allegiance written by Francis Bellamy. He was a uh, socialist minister in 1892. He wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, and then I tie all that into the history of Colin Kaepernick's protests. Okay. So you get that one as well. And then you can get, you can purchase these individually or in a bundle pack. Uh, this one here, this is a double lecture I did with Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. Uh, so he dealt with, information from his book and research from his book. And I deal with great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. So it's a double lecture that we did. So you get that one. And also uh, this four hour presentation I did, redistributing the pain, redistributing the pain, how African-Americans historically fought back with economic boycott. So I show you documented examples of us using different types of economic withdrawal strategies to fight back against white supremacy and racism. Okay. And because these are strategies largely we can implement today, but a lot of people don't know these success stories. A lot of people don't know that history. So that's a four hour presentation that I deal with. I deal with it in that four hour presentation and redistributing the pain comes from Dr. King's last speech. Uh, I've been to the mountaintop April 3rd, 1968. He said, we have to, find a way to redistribute the pain. And he's speaking to the sanitation workers of Memphis, Tennessee. And he, he talks about boycotting uh, Coca-Cola and Hearts Bread and Wonder Bread and still test milk for the discriminatory, discriminatory hiring practices. He talks about supporting African-American owned banks and life insurance companies and, and business and, and boycotting businesses who are uh, not treating us uh, correctly, et cetera. He's talking about economic withdrawal. He says we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. That's in his last speech. I've been to the mountaintop. Now, during Dr. King Day, they'll usually show you the last two minutes of the speech, or he's talking about getting to the mountaintop, but they don't show you the, the part of the speech where he's talking about economics, okay, and economic empowerment. They don't usually show you that part of the speech. 
this this one here, uh, the light of ancient Egypt awakens the African mind to economic empowerment. This was uh, one I did during African American History Month as well. I did this February twenty fifth, two thousand seventeen. It's another good presentation. And uh, this one here deals with a lot of history. Human guinea pigs. This deals with the history of, of the Tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis on a Negro male and separating fact from fiction. Because the experiment, contrary to popular belief and so and memes on social media that don't provide any sources, uh, the study did not inject men with syphilis. There were six. There were six hundred men in the study. Three hundred ninety nine of the men had an early form of syphilis called latent syphilis which means you have syphilis, but you don't have any symptoms. They had latent syphilis. And uh, there were 201 men who were the control group. They didn't have syphilis. So you compare the group that has syphilis to the group that doesn't have syphilis, okay? The study was the study was was not a good study. I'm not saying that it was good. I'm saying a lot of information flowing around about it is just wrong. They didn't inject them with syphilis. So we uh, I deal with that whole study in... in uh, it was originally supposed to be last six to nine months, ended up lasting 40 years. So we deal with the whole history of it and how it became known, uh, how it became exposed and why it was shut down, et cetera. OK, so we have that one. And then. Um, this one here. Uh, Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. So we deal with some well-known and not so well-known. Uh, women in our history from all different time periods. Uh, you'll get the four hour version. It's a two DVD set, uh, four hours. Uh, this one this one deals with lessons from the film Black Panther. I'm doing a presentation to 65th through 12th graders and their teachers. And we're dealing with different themes from the film Black Panther, how they actually relate to history, how they can actually use this uh, to teach history. OK, so this is I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, also. So we have that one uh, in the bundle pack. This is all in the same bundle pack. Uh, African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, how uh, elections have consequences. And I deal with three main things. I deal with uh, similarities between Richard Nixon becoming president in 68 and Donald Trump becoming president in 2016. And Nixon is a backlash to the civil rights movement, the black power movement, the rebellions taking place uh, in the country at the time. And then, um, Donald Trump is a backlash to two terms of President Barack Obama and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, any perceived advances African-Americans made, et cetera. He's a backlash to that. Uh, I also deal with the voter suppression that took place during the 2016 election um, as well. OK, so there's a lot of information in that one. And this last one here, ancient Kemet, the winter sources and the history of Christmas. Ancient Kemet, the winter solstice, and the history of Christmas. So this deals with the pre-Christian um, celebrations, winter solstice celebrations that existed before Christmas that influenced, that uh, are going to be incorporated into the celebration of Christmas that will um, shape the creation of what we know as the celebration of Christmas, okay? And, you know, we deal with pre-Christian uh, ancient, ancient ancient winter uh, festivals celebrated by Europeans like the Festival of Saturnalia, the Festival of Mithra, the Festival of Yule, et cetera. And these usually took place either around the winter solstice, December 21st, or the vernal equinox, March 21st, the vernal equinox, March, the first day of spring. OK, so that's a deep presentation. Ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas, and it ties into Asara, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and Heru being born on December 25th to a virgin birth by uh, Aset, or who the Greeks called Isis, okay? So some of this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. So we provide you with that information. So that's the Michael M. Hotel Black History Month 15 DVD bundle pack. It's available right now at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com right on the home page. So we are uh, shipping these orders out. And uh, we'll post a link here again as well. Uh, okay, so, hey, we'll be back. Uh, we're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time and Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. 
They have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. Um, we'll be back uh, Sunday night. And uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, you can, we also have a recommended reading list of books there. Click on book list. You can read articles I've written. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Turn on notifications so you know when we go live. Follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P uh, as well. And if you like this type of information, uh, if you want to support us and donate to The African History Network, dial us on The AHN Show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash The AHN Show. All right. Talk to you all. We'll talk to you all Sunday night, okay? Take care. Peace. Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have postpaid and profit sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today. Intuitive Design Clothing is an online accessory store that sells one-of-a-kind signature statement pieces for men and women. They also specialize in fashion consultations, closet organization, and decorating small spaces. Are you looking for a statement piece for a special affair, or would you like to add some select pieces to your ensemble of accessories? If you're looking for something different, definitely contact Kath Norman, owner and CEO of Intuitive Design Clothing. Visit their website, intuitivedesignclothing.com. That's intuitivedesignclothing.com, and you can email her at info at intuitivedesignclothing.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is where every entrance is a grand entrance. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at cometicwear.com. With blackbusinesstea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business, know your numbers, and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black-owned businesses. Visit the website BlackBusinessTea.com. That's BlackBusinessTea.com. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, 
Museum Studies, Hip Hop and Race Relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197, or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at b history101 at yahoo.com bhistory101 at yahoo.com gain knowledge in minutes with blacklist ed blacklist ed is an app that provides insightful summaries of books pertaining to the black experience as black people we know the importance of reading books to discover our incredible contributions to world history to uplift our self-esteem and to empower ourselves for our relentless fight for social justice Unfortunately, with our busy lives, it feels like there is never enough time to read a book. Fortunately, there's a solution. With Blacklist Ed, their app provides key insights from best-selling books about the black experience, therefore saving you time, increasing your knowledge, and empowering yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. You can read or listen on the go. Start your free trial today by going to blacklisted.com. That's black without the C, B-L-A-K. Or you can download the Blacklist Ed app from the App Store or Google Play. Blacklist Ed, empower yourself. Have you tasted the world famous No Frowny Brownie yet from the Pink Bakery? If not, what are you waiting for? They are vegan, gluten-free, and free of the big eight allergens. While eating their no frowny brownies, the fabulous Miss Tabitha Brown said they were very good. Very good. And you know, if she says that, they are. The Pink Bakery is the first black-owned, big eight allergen-free baking mix company. Go to thepinkbakery.com, that's thepinkbakery.com, to order their No Frowny Brownie Mix today. Yaya Rule is a line of African print-inspired apparel catered to the black community. The pieces include t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, dresses, skirts, activewear, bags, and other accessories and home decor. This brand offers a revived way for men and women to wear their black pride and honor their African heritage anywhere at any time. This apparel line is for anyone, whether you are working in the corporate world, are an entrepreneur, or an artist. Their selection will allow you to casually let your pride shine or dress it up as wanted. It is for those who have already embraced African fabrics and for those who are just getting introduced to them. Reclaim and experience a part of our culture with rich and colorful African prints. The clothing line and the accessories are available right now starting at $17.99.